My name is Jerry Fritz. I'm the Executive Vice President of One Media 3.0, a subsidiary of Sinclair Broadcast Group. Our company's been at the forefront of the design and deployment of the Next Gen TV standard, ATSC 3.0, for some time. This presentation provides a, a high-level overview of the newly adopted digital transmission standard that's been developed by the Advanced Television Systems Committee. The ATSC, as many of you know, is an international standard-setting organization of over 150 members. It coordinates television standards among broadcast, equipment, motion picture, consumer electronics, computer, cable, satellite, and semiconductor industries. The ATSC has been working on the Next Gen TV standard for over five years. It's now been adopted and deployed in South Korea and recently approved for use in the United States with deployment now underway. So with that, let's talk about the Next Gen TV standard. What's this all about? Why are we doing this? Well, this has been a major sea change among the most significant changes in our industry in over a half century. It rivals the move from black and white to color or even the move from analog to digital. It's still broadcasting and when we went over the air broadcasting analog to digi digital, it was still broadcasting to the rabbit ears on your television set. And then in 1996, we approved a new standard to go digital. We simulcast until 2009, and then what, what did we get? Well, we got television that is high definition, we got stereo, we got 16 by 9 aspect ratios, and we got Diginets. When we moved from uh, analog to ATSC 1, now we moved to ATSC 3.0. It's still broadcasting, but now it's got mobility. Now it goes to multiple devices that's connected uh, to the internet and now has incredibly uh, beautiful uh, pictures and audio to go with it. Plus, there are multiple new business opportunities for all broadcasters. Why are we doing this? Well, analog became digital, but ATSC1 has significant limitations. This is what a computer looked like 20 years ago. In that same two decades, we've seen a vast proliferation of uh, incredible laptop uh, uh, computing devices. This computing device, or the one on your desk, is probably over 5,000% uh, the computing capacity of, uh, of the computer 20 years ago. In that same 20-year span, we've seen exactly zero change to the digital standard in the United States. That means we don't get deep building penetration. That means that we don't have access to signals via the internet. That means we don't have incredible, incredibly beautiful pictures and immersive sound. It means that we don't have mobile television. It means that we don't have the ability to hyper-localize or personalize either programming or advertising to our audiences. It means that we are living in a competitive environment with a spoon when what we really want is a Swiss Army knife. Think of it this way. The cellular telephone network has significant limitations. It has a one-to-one -one architecture. Think of bringing your cell phone to a football game and wanting to view instant replays the exact same way you watch them at home. What would happen? Well, if you could get a signal and uh, if you could uh, uh, watch the game on that cellular phone, it would pixelate, it would buffer for 20 or 30 seconds, it would be a terrible viewing experience. And if all 70,000 people in the stadium tried to access the same uh, signal at the same time, it wouldn't work. It would melt the internet. Why? Because the one-to-one -one limitation uh, of the cellular network is overloaded. And when you went home to take a look at your bill, what would you find? A dramatic data charge uh, for that experience. To the contrary, over the air is a one-to-many architecture. It has significant uh, efficiency advantages over the cellular one-to-one -one network. It's still broadcasting, but to multiple, to infinite number of devices, and substantially it has major enhancements uh, above uh, the ATSC-1 standard. 
first significant advantage of ATSC3 is that it's based upon the internet protocol with dynamic flexibility. Think of it this way. Think of the pipe as a giant data pipe. That is the platform that we're using filled with thousands of straws. Each one of those straws can represent an individual program stream. So for example, if you're watching a baseball game and it goes into extra innings, some of the audience might want to watch the extra innings. Some of the audience might want regularly scheduled programming. Now broadcasters have the ability to satisfy both, to insert a new bro uh, program stream so that those who want to watch the uh, extra innings can do so, and those that want to watch a regularly scheduled program to do, can do so. That's the IP pipe and multiple dynamic streams. The major significant change between ATSC1 and ATSC3 is a change to the modulation standard. We've gone from what we call 8VSB to OFDM, 8 vestigial sideband to orthogonal frequency division multiplexing. Let me explain it simply this way. Let's suppose that you have a football field and you gave a football to a great big giant football player and said, run from one end of the field to the other. What's likely to happen to that football? Well, the player's going to get tackled. He's going to uh, fumble the ball. He's going to lose the ball. That ball is not going to get to the other side. Now, instead of giving that ball to a big football player, suppose you gave it to a little peewee football player. And maybe not one or two or three. Let's suppose you gave that football to a thousand different peewee football players. The odds are some of those balls are going to get to the other side. That's the difference between 8VSB and OFDM. And what does that mean? And that means that there's no multipath distortion. That means that there's no ghosting. That means that there's no fading. What that means is that for the first time ever, we have mobile television. That is a huge increase in capabilities uh, enabled by ATSC 3.0. What do audiences expect from this new standard? Well, audiences want an IP-based system that's flexible, that can be received on multiple devices. Think of that great big giant data uh, pipe that has lots of uh, video streams coming out of it. It's broadcast over the air with the ability to uh, match up with the internet, and we get multiple screens with companion devices. So think of your children watching the big screen uh, uh, television in your home, looking at their laptops, looking at their cell phones, all um, being uh, supplied and uh, programmed by uh, the ATSC3 standard. Audiences also want mobility, both portable, walking around, and in their vehicles. They want their program anywhere. So that means in their cars, in, on laptops, that means uh, on uh, tablet devices, that means on their cell phones, that means anywhere, anytime. Audiences also expect ultra high definition video and enhanced immersive audio. That means that ultra high definition can be viewed in incredible detail and with colors with wide color gamut close to what the human eye can see in reality and low light definition uh, enabled by high dynamic range with uh, immersive audio so that the pictures almost jump off the screen in three dimension it is an incredible viewing experience Audiences also want deep building penetration and enhanced in-home viewing. Today, if you try to watch uh, a, a television program over the air uh, in your basement, this is what you'd get. In fact, you wouldn't even get snow. You might just get black because of the cliff effect. When I was growing up, this is what the family did. We watched it over the air. We could see it in our basements, and that was what television was. You can't do that today. We want to return to the ability uh, for uh, families to be able to view television on any device in their homes. Audiences also expect advanced emergency alert functions. Rather than seeing a crawl that goes over the top of the screen, wouldn't it be great to see live Doppler radar? Wouldn't it be great to see evacuation routes? And wouldn't it be great to see what the weather actually looked like and, and see the, uh, the, 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 the severe weather shelters? Wouldn't it be great to hear this in multiple languages? And wouldn't it be great to wake up sleeping devices 
with the recognition that not all weather catastrophes happen during the day. We formed a, an entity called the Advanced Warning and Response Network that takes the capabilities, the advanced emergency alert functions that are, that are embedded in the 3.0 standard and is working to integrate those uh, into the broadcasting platform. What do broadcasters want? I love this, this slide from Marlena Dietrich uh, from 1939. What broadcasters want is that there's gold in them nar hills, and that's what this is all about. It this way, a broadcaster today using ATSC 1.0 has a six megahertz channel. You need about and that translates to about 19.4 megabits. You need about 11 megabits to do a high definition signal. The other remaining megabits are used for DigiNets, DTV subchannels uh, that can be uh, broadcast over the air. In an ATSC3 world, that same 6 megahertz TV channel is now equivalent to about 25 megabits. And because of compression technology, you only need about 4 megabits to do a high definition signal. What are you going to do with the other 21 megabits? Well, there's other services, both television and data services, for the first time. And that's incredibly compelling to broadcasters. Broadcasters expect gateways to legacy devices. As you know, ATSC3 is not backward compatible. That means that all of the uh, uh, devices that exist today will not take an ATSC3 signal. That's why manufacturers will build into new devices a gateway, which will then use the embedded Wi-Fi in the home to light up uh, existing ATSC-1 devices that now will be capable of getting the ATSC-3 programming. A car can be a hotspot or a, a gateway device to provide entertainment, uh, laptop entertainment, telematics, and uh, other uh, programming to portable devices. Broadcasters also expect the ability to target programming and advertising using single frequency networks. Those networks are available in Europe today, but they aren't used in the United States. But using distributed telecommunications services that are authorized by the FCC, we can now have single frequency networks that fill in gaps and extend service areas to provide the ability to target programming and advertising. And think of how useful that will be in your market, especially in hyphenated markets where you could sell the same programming to different advertisers in different parts of uh, the market. This is a single frequency network that exists in Baltimore and Washington today. What's interesting about this slide is that this is why the FCC was created in 1934 to begin with, to prevent exactly this scenario where two broadcasters with overlapping signals can use the same uh, channel. What this enables us today to, to do is have localized newscasts or targeted advertising or pinpoint emergency alerts. It allows local high school sporting events in different high schools and different parts of the DMA at the same time. Separate public affairs programming, focused political debates in different parts of the, the market, overtime games as we discussed earlier, and it even allows for personalized PBS fundraising for those uh, that don't want to watch the megathons all the time. They've already paid. Now they have the ability to watch encore programming from Pittsburgh, the doo-wop concert, whatever it is. Broadcasters also expect multiple channels to sell. That's right, sell. While we're required to provide a free over-the-air service, we are not limited to just free over-the-air. We can use our uh, ability uh, that's uh, embedded in the 3.0 standard to have conditional access to provide a skinny bundle pay-per-view competitive service to OTT or to uh, the MVPDs. Broadcasters also expect the ability to provide dynamic ad insertion. That's the ability to take 
uh, uh, substitute a national, a regional, or a local ad right in the programming on a real-time basis to provide different advertising to different individuals um, based on demographics. We're working with Imagine Communications and Crystal and Guyan Communications to provide this service uh, that was demonstrated recently at the last NAB convention. Casters also want enhanced audience measurement. Right now, we, per, we get our uh, data from Nielsen and Comscore, which is very expensive. Within the ATSC3 uh, standard is the ability to uh, get real-time um, uh, audience measurement statistics without having to uh, buy the expensive service from Nielsen or Comscore uh, through the use of 3.0 watermarking, uh, taking the data, putting it right into the programming, and then the ability to collect that uh, data uh, on individual viewers. This will give us data analytics the likes of which we've never seen before. Investors also want new business opportunities. Remember I said that we're 21 megabits uh, useful uh, in addition to the free over-the-air service. What are you going to do with those extra 21 megabits? Well, we could provide distance learning. We could support digital billboards. We could be ebook distributors or provide telematics uh, to cars. Those of you who have um, a, a navigation system in your car and you need to update the maps because they're they're old, what do you have to do today? Well, you have to take the car in to the dealership, they'll charge you $200 and you'll get new maps. Wouldn't it be great if you could get those over the air instantaneously? Broadcasters using 3.0 could provide uh, agriculture support, turning on and off sprinkler systems, building maintenance, the backbone of the Internet of Things, Broadcasters can provide, as I said earlier, a competitive or complementary service uh, to OTT uh, on a, a for-pay basis. If you're Microsoft and you want to uh, uh, access 30 million users uh, instantaneously for an operating system upgrade, if you try to do that today via the Internet, it wouldn't work. You'd melt the Internet. Uh, it just doesn't have the capacity to handle something like that. Using broadcasting architectures, one to many, however, you would be able to provide that service. It's a perfect complementary service in a 5G world. In 2020, when much of the country is enabled with 3.0, what else happens? That's the date that Detroit has targeted uh, for the deployment of uh, autonomous driving vehicles, driverless cars. What do those cars need more than anything else? Well, they need vast amounts of data for 3D mapping so they don't bump into each other or bump into obstacles. You can't provide that via Wi-Fi, you can't provide that via the cell phone system, but the broadcasting system is uniquely capable of providing exactly those services. If you're Netflix or Sling TV or Hulu or Apple TV and you want to uh, uh, cache the latest movie on the home of the at the home of the viewer, you can't do that via efficiently do, via uh, the internet today because you clog up the last mile. Wouldn't it be great if you could use broadcasters' bits, rent our bits, to provide that last mile in an efficient way? Uh, and if you link up the entire country that is operating in 3.0, then you have the ability to provide a CONUS service, a continental United States service, to the entire country that's a useful data. And you have to ask yourself, what is it that broadcasters can do or that Verizon or AT&T can do that broadcasters can't do? This is a significant potential in a 5G world to work as complementary uh, uh, platforms uh, to the uh, telcos. If you wanted to take 5 megabits of that uh, 25 megabit stream in that 6 megahertz channel to provide 150 radio stations, well, you'd be able to do that. That means we could provide a competitive over-the-air uh, service to the likes of Sirius XM. We could also use our system to provide virtual reality uh, to, uh, for those uh, uh, upcoming uses uh, of, our, of our platform. What is this ATSC3 uh, standard? Well, it's really 21 standards and three recommended practices. 
the FCC was asked to and only approved two of what we call the physical layer uh, uh, standards. The rest has been adopted by the ATSC and does not require uh, any FCC or any other government approval. Let's talk about deployment. How is this going to be deployed? Well, as we recall, when we went from analog to digital, uh, that was a mandated standard. Uh, we all got second channels. We had to simulcast for 11 years, and then there was a flash cut in 2009, and everybody went over to the digital standard. The Congress and the FCC set the deadlines. Uh, the government gave some um, assistance with coupons to for those people who didn't want to buy new sets and wanted to use their existing analog sets they provided uh, money for converter boxes uh, education was mandated the consumers were uninformed and, uh, and many broadcasters didn't understand the impl uh, implications of the new standard uh, the differences between UHF and VHF penetration and what the cliff effect meant to their viewers the impact was that the signal quality is fixed only. There's, uh, there's, there's no deep building penetration. We have multi-path, we have fading, we have ghosting, which means that the signal does not work in a mobile environment. And it essentially froze our industry in time. In the ATSC 1 to ATSC 3 conversion, however, it is voluntary. It's going to be done on an ad hoc basis. Uh, instead of getting a second channel, we are going to be using channel sharing techniques. Uh, the marketplace uh, is flexible. It's going to be converted uh, on a market-by-market uh, -market basis and related to the repack of uh, the, uh, that, that uh, the commission has required as a result of the incentive auction. The conversion will be multiple markets. The, the uh, rescan will be required uh, for new receivers uh, as they are rolled out. Education will be at our discretion. We have com consumer education that's required and notifications to uh, the cable and satellite uh, carriers so that they can modify their platforms. The impact, however, will be aside from multiple rescans as the system rolls out on a market by market basis, but we're going to have better quality. We're going to have better penetration and mobility with a standard that's both evolvable and extensible. At the uh, uh, analog to digital conversion, we all got a second channel. Uh, we had 11 years of simulcasting and then had to give back the analog channel. They gave us uh, coupons so that we could um, uh, buy converter boxes, and that was how the deployment happened. Concurrent deployment repack schedule for 3.0 really goes along with the uh, incentive auction. As you know, 14 channels or 84 megahertz was sold to the uh, telcos. The broadcasters, about a thousand of, of them, uh, occupying those channels uh, had to be moved, repacked into channels 21 to 36 or 14 to 20, and some have moved down to the VHF. Because of the daisy chain effect, a lot of other broadcasters are going to have to change channels as well. What does that mean? That means that many broadcasters are going to need new antennas and new transmitters, but the new transmitters will be facile. They will be both uh, ATSC-1 and ATSC-3 capable. When you implement that on a nationwide basis, you have problems. This is what uh, the uh, country is going to look like during this repack. There are some problems on the Mexican and Canadian borders, but the real problem is in the Northeast uh, that is so densely populated. The FCC, as you know, has a 10-phase plan that uh, requires us to move in 39 months. Uh, who knows whether that 39 months is a good a target. It's certainly a target. Whether or not it's going to be met is uh, remains to be seen. Uh, linking all of the markets together is a, a goal for uh, those using 3.0. Why? Because this consortium that has been developed between Sinclair and Tribune and Nexstar and Univision and others is going to pro provide the capability to provide a data network across the entire country that's usable by any a national distributor, but can also provide regional and local um, uh, conversion capabilities as well. 
Uh, this consortium has been renamed Spectrum Co. and is in the process of helping the deployment and then the linking of all of the markets to provide this type of 5G service. In terms of the repack schedule, if you're wondering where your market comes out in the repack schedule, here is a, uh, a, a website that will tell you exactly where you are in the repack time frame. What the FCC requires last November, the FCC said that this was a voluntary optional deployment uh, in, in which we have to simulcast the current and the ATSC 3.0 transmission using a host guest uh, uh, deployment scheme. <clears throat> MVPDs have must carry obligations on cable for the 1.0 signal, not for the 3.0 signal. The licensing is a temporary second channel where the guest uh, will retain its license when it moves over to the host. The applications is supposedly one step process that, process that the commission says will be expedited. All of the public interest obligations remain. So when you're putting out your 3.0 signal, you still have emergency alert requirements, closed captioning, political rules, the indecency restrictions, uh, employment obligations, uh, children's television contest sponsor, all of the public interest obligations remain in a 3.0 world. And we have advanced notice uh, requirements as well. Here's an example. This is just an example of what, how the deployment might work in a particular market. Let's take a look at this market. This market has seven television stations, Univision, ABC, CBS, PBS, Fox, CW, and NBC. Two of those stations are VHF stations. The other five are UHF stations. All are broadcasting a uh, high-definition signal. In fact, the CW is broadcasting two high-definition signals. That's the world today. They all have high-definition, and they're carrying digital subchannels as well. This is 100% penetrations over the air with MVPD carriage as well. Uh, certainly for the high definition signal, maybe not all for the um, standard definition uh, digital digicasts. Uh, transition world for ATSC3, let's assume that the Univision station on the left and the NBC station on the right are going to convert to 3.0 and the five other stations will be host stations. Because of the required and voluntary simulcast rules of the FCC, you've, you see that the Univision HD moves over to the ABC station, the NBC HD moves over to the Fox, and then the digital subchannels, the two for Univision move over to CBS, two for from NBC move over to the PBS station and one that moves over to the CW. That requires a cooperative marketplace negotiations. That's how the 1.0 hosting will work. But in addition to 1.0 hosting, we have hosting. And here we have the Univision and the NBC stations hosting the HD signals from the uh, other channels. So this also requires cooperative marketplace negotiations, but the ABC HD will go to the Univision, so will the CBS, as will the PBS stations. The Fox will go over to NBC, the, CB, the CW HD along with the MyNet will go over to the NBC. So at the end of the day, is the Univision having five HD signals and one HD, the NBC having four HD and three SDs, and you can see the hosting stations that are carrying uh, one or two HD signals along with SD channels as well. That's post-transition. That's what the first step of a transition will look like, again, requiring cooperative marketplace negotiations. If you're going to deploy a single frequency network, and we will, uh, we this is an example of what's going on in uh, the Dallas rollout now, where DISH is actually testing a next-gen 700 megahertz channel on one of our SFN sticks. And what what's important about that test is they're using 5 megahertz, using 3.0 technology with a return path. If that return path were to be deployed nationally, then broadcasters would have the very efficient one to infinite download, but now a capable, uh, a, a, the capability of having a return path uh, as well, uh, which would be extremely useful in, uh, in any data scenario. 
that means that there is a potential for 5G convergence. In terms of the channel sharing agreements, uh, this is these are the types of elements that everyone is uh, going to have to consider as they uh, derive their agreements. You're going to have to figure out who's the host and who's the tenant, which, which is going to be the VHF, the UHF host, and what the signal contours will be. You'll need to consider matching contours so that you can ensure MVPT carriage and expedited processing at the FCC. Are non-commercial educational stations going to participate? There are special rules that involve uh, public broadcasting stations. What's the channel mapping going to, look, going to look like? Who's going to get the voluntary? Who's going to get the required simulcasts? Where are all of the stations going to be moved? And is there going to be a home for all of the DigiNets? Are there bit requirements? What type of advanced encoders and compression techniques are going to be necessary to, uh, to make the channel sharing agreement work? We have to take into consideration the FCC rules. The content requirements are, are, are a key. Is there going to be a fee for a hosting or cross-hosting? Is there going to be, what, what type of sharing of uh, operating plans uh, is going to be necessary and what type of equipment is going to be necessary? And if you're going to deploy a single frequency network, you have to figure out where the site selection is going to be, who's going to design the RF, who's going to manage the site, what zoning and permitting issues are involved in, in getting that site selection, what hardware and licensing. These are some of the issues that will have to be incorporated in any channel sharing agreement. What's going to cost? Well, for single stations, the estimated, and this is just an estimate, of all in cost for a new exciter, a mask filter, test equipment, the studio to transmitter links, the audio and video encoders, the schedulers, the installation, is about between three and six hundred thousand dollars, so the average is around $450,000. Importantly, that auction repack fund, the 1.75 plus the recently uh, added a billion dollars, uh, should be able to partially offset the expenses, certainly, of the 3.0 transmitters. The capital recovery on that is something on, on the order of about two years. If you're going to deploy a single frequency network that extends the station's signal to distant parts of the DMA or fills in signals in high interference areas that supports mobility and the hyper-localized zoning of programming and advertising, well, the costs are going to be between a quarter and a half million dollars per site. Uh, so if you had five translators ranging between 1.25 and 2.5 million dollars for that SFN network. Note uh, clearly, though, that the facilities are likely to be shared and managed by third parties, uh, so those costs will be shared among many broadcasters in the market, and the capital recovery is uh, less than seven years. What does this mean for you? At the station, the stations are going to have new things to do. In the news department, we're talking about hyper-localized stories, restacking by geography, dem demographic-based content, and emergency notices with rich media. On the promotion side, you're going to have multiple programming streams uh, to, uh, to deal with, cross-promotional vehicles, customizable content, and much larger audiences, including younger and mobile audiences than you have today. On the ops and engineering side, well, you have to maintain these single frequency networks with multiple transmit transmitters, multiple video streams using ultra high definition and high dynamic range and wide color gamut, uh, dynamic programming streams with content flexibilities and deployment uh, facility sharing. So a lot of work for ops and engineering. On the sales side, you're going to have multiple content streams to sell, dynamic ad insertion, programmatic and addressable ads, bits for sale, and newfound data analytics that you haven't had before. On the administration side, you have new businesses to, to take into account uh, with uh, the sale of your inter internet protocol bits, and we have deployment and sharing agreements to manage. All in all, it means better TV and new businesses, and hopefully a lot of extra money for the stations. All this technology has to be monetized as well. Uh, engineers stand in front of 
of whiteboards and they come up with new ideas. Those ideas are, are reduced to patents and some of those will be standard essential patents. Uh, those get incorporated in chips, 3.0 chips, uh, that get uh, built into televisions and to laptops and to tablets and to, to cell phones eventually. We're working with a company called Sankia Labs right now uh, in India on uh, designing the first of the 3.0 mobile chips. Uh, we're also working with MPEG LA, which is a patent pool so that licensors of owners of, of 3.0 patents can uh, band together and have a single efficient license that they can sell uh, for the, uh, the um, uh, patents uh, to the uh, manufacturers. And those agreements will include what's called FRAN, uh, fair and reasonable and non-discriminatory rates so that the manufacturers know what the cost of the 3.0 uh, technology will be as they put it in their, uh, their received devices. What's the future of broadcasting? It's still television, but now it's 4K Ultra HD. It's zoned advertising. It's hyper-local. And all of the other things that we can now do, uh, the services that we can now provide in, in broadcasting, distance learning, agriculture, home safety, public safety, digital signage, maps and, and traffic and navigation systems and ebooks and weather emergencies and building maintenance and so much more limited by only what the human imagination can dream up. That's the future of broadcasting. And if we don't pursue this, and this is really a key, if we don't pursue this new standard, then our industry really lags behind and we may not have a television industry going forward. So the future of ATSC 3.0 is bright. The future of broadcasting is bright. And I thank you for your attention.